Hello, welcome back to the channel. Today, I want to talk to you about Cheddar Man um, and introduce the concept of the identical ancestor point. And before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to Audrey or Adri. I'm not sure how to pronounce it correctly, but they're a subscriber who said, what do you think about a video um, about the identical ancestor point? Um, and I know that that was a month ago at this point, but um, I want to thank you for the suggestion. Um, I've had a lot of fun making this, and hopefully you find this uh, informative. Um, however, one thing I want to start off with is just talking a little bit about what Cheddar Man, who Cheddar Man was. So Cheddar Man was discovered um, in Cheddar Grove in Somerset, England in 1903. So we've had this specimen, this archaic human, we've had it around for a long time. It's dated at about 10,000 years old. Um, but it made the news recently for having its nuclear genome sequenced. Um, I believe it had its mitochondrial genome sequence a little bit farther back, um, but it was a, a big splash in the news and a lot of pop science articles kind of took that data and ran with it. Um, and one of the things that came out of that is this particular claim. Um, the, mesolith the mesolithic skeleton known as Cheddar Man shares the same DNA with English teacher of history. Um, this is a picture of the of the guy that's supposedly a, a modern relative of Cheddar Man. Um, and here's another headline, 10,000 year old skeleton found in Britain has a modern day descendant living close by. And this had a lot of people excited and they thought it was a really cool thing. Oh, look, you know, there's a modern descendant of someone that lived 300 generations ago, et cetera, et cetera. However, this was not without some backlash. So on Twitter, you might be familiar with uh, Adam Rutherford. He's written a lot of books, done a lot on like evolutionary biology, science communication. Um, and he tweeted, now the original tweet has already been deleted by the time I screenshot this, um, but this is basically what he said. Please don't make me do this again. If Cheddar Man has any single living descendant, then he is the ancestor of literally everyone on earth. And it says the ancestor should say an ancestor, um, just to be nitpicky there. But anyway, not metaphorically or conceptually, but actually mathematically, all humans, everyone, etc. cetera. Um, and he received a lot of backlash about this. If you go back to this tweet, read through all of the comments, there is a lot of dissent with this particular statement. Um, and as they do, population geneticists like Vince Buffalo over here came to, not that Adam necessarily needed a rescue, but he came to his rescue and basically stated, you know, yeah, there, I see there's a lot of skepticism about this tweet. However, he is correct about this. And then he goes on to explain why. There were a lot of other population geneticists that basically did the same thing, um, that explained why, again, if Cheddar Man has any living descendants today, any at all, then he would be an ancestor of all of us. Um, so what I want to do today is explain to you why that is, um, kind of walk you through just sort of the basics of the math behind it and uh, kind of give you some very simple conceptual models for you to understand why Rutherford and Vince Buffalo and Graham Coop and a lot of the others that tweeted about this are actually correct. And in doing so, hopefully we can learn a little bit about the identical ancestor point. Okay, so first things first, let's talk about pedigrees. Um, and we need to talk about one, the difference between a genealogical pedigree and a genetic pedigree. So over here on the right, this is you down here at the bottom, and then I've divided your pedigree in half. On the left is the maternal line, and on the right is the paternal line. Um, and so red is for mom, blue is for dad, and as you can see, they, it splits in two every single generation back until you get farther and farther and farther out where you've got these tiny little thin lines representing every single ancestor in your genealogical tree, both maternally and paternally. So your genealogical pedigree includes all your ancestors and it grows at a rate of two raised to the K, where K is the number of generations in the past. And so I've just plotted this down here. So the number of generations up to 10, and then the number of ancestors you have, obviously at 10 generations, you have a thousand ancestors in your pedigree, in your genealogical pedigree, right? Um, and this number, as I, as you can see here, grows exponentially. So it gets really, really big, really, really quickly. Um, let's juxtapose that with your genetic pedigree. So your genetic pedigree, however, 
um, is a lot fewer individuals and that it actually begins to flatten off and decay a lot faster than your uh, genealogical pedigree. Um, and this is because the probability that you inherited any um, genetic material at all from a given ancestor is half times the number of generations back to that specific ancestor, right? Tracing that line to that ancestor. Um, and this is just based on Mendelian inheritance, right? So since your mother is only going to give you one chromosome, she's given you one chromosome or one you know set of chromosomes that are either from her mother or from her father, which means you have a 50% chance, ignoring recombination, uh, a 50% chance of not receiving any genetic material from your maternal grandfather or your maternal grandmother, right? So that's why as you go backwards in time in the genetic pedigree here, the white spots represent individuals that left you no ancestry at all, no genetic ancestry. So what I've done down here as I've plotted in black is still the number of pedigree ancestors and I've increased it out to 20 generations on the on the uh, on the X um, with the Y still being the number of ancestors. So again, you can see the number of genealogical ancestors continues, jumps up exponentially, whereas the number of genetic ancestors initially increases with the genealogical, but then it's begins to to deflate and starts to flatten as you get further and further out. Um, and this is important and it's going to play a role a little bit later on because what this means is that the time to the most recent common ancestor, which is based on the genetic pedigree, is a different time than your genealogical common ancestor, which is the identical ancestor point. Um, and I know it's a little bit uh, of a mind twist to think that those two numbers can be different, but they are, and we're going to talk about why they are uh, shortly. Okay, so going back to the genealogical pedigree, and one thing that might initially come to your mind is that this seems to introduce a paradox, right? That if the genealogical pedigree increases at a rate of two to the K, then within just you know, a handful of generations back, you should have billions of individuals in your pedigree, right? Like that pedigree is going to just explode in size really, really quickly. And in fact, it's going to get so big that it will encompass more individuals than have ever lived on the planet. And this creates a kind of paradox. Like how can that possibly be? Well, importantly, populations aren't infinite, right? There, every single generation, there's a finite number of individuals on the planet, um, and because of that, and since you have to have two to the K number of ancestors, because every single individual has a mother and a father, right, then eventually what's going to happen is you're going to have to start resampling the same individuals. So over here, this is a, a simulation that was done by Graham Coop's lab. If we start off in generation zero, this is you, and then you have mother and father, and then they have two, two parents, and then they have two parents, et cetera, et cetera, going back. When you start to see these little black circles, these are individuals that appear more than once in the pedigree. So for this, this is a simulation for a population of size, I think 100,000. And you can see by generation nine, you have four individuals that are being resampled in your pedigree. By generation 14, every single individual and represented by all of these black circles has been resampled in the pedigree, right? So importantly, what this means is that the pedigree backwards in time, this is again, the genealogical pedigree collapses onto itself. And this happens approximately where two to the K is equal to the population size, right? So um, in, in this case, we're thinking about a constant population size, but it can fluctuate. Like regardless of what the size is, uh, eventually two to the K is going to equal that size, right? It's going to equal that population size and individuals are going to start being resampled. And once that happens, once individuals are resampled in the pedigree, it starts to just collapse. Um, so if that doesn't seem very clear to you, if you're like, wait, that doesn't make a lot of sense, let's take this very simple model and walk through how it works. So starting at generation zero, this is a, obviously a very, very small population, um, the red being the potential mothers and the blue being potential fathers. Um, so we'll start right here. This is you at the star at generation zero. So at generation one, 
obviously you have a mother and a father. The expected number of ancestors you have in the preceding generation is exactly two. And as we can see, the actual number of ancestors you have is two, right? So, okay, now let's go one more generation back. Now we have sampled, now this, your mother has a mother and a father and your father has a mother and a father. So the expected number of ancestors in generation two is four. And as we can see, the actual number is four. At generation three, again, we're just expanding backwards. The expected number is eight. The actual number is eight. But notice now what happens. In generation four, since we're going this two to the K increase every generation back, but we have a constant population size, right? The population is not going to get bigger. It's the same size. Then the number of ancestors we should get is 16, but there's not 16 individuals to choose from. So what that means is that individuals have to be resampled, right? And so the pedigree starts to make these little loops. We call these inbreeding loops, right? So by generation four, for a constant population size of 10 with equal sex ratios, five male, five female, the expected number is 16, but the actual number of ancestors that you have in generation four is only 10. Now, at this point, obviously, two to the K is equal to N, um, but it, again, this is just a very simplistic model just to show you why it is that your pedigree ancestors eventually have to start resampling themselves. Um, and again, the same thing, the expected number of ancestors in generation five is 32, um, but the actual number, since the population is constant, is 10. So we're just, once again, resampling the existing number of individuals because we just can't, there's no more individuals to grab from, right? Um, so what that means is that you can see very clearly if any of these individuals at generation five left any descendants at all to the modern day, to this generation, right, generation zero, then they definitionally are the ancestor of everyone alive because they represent the entire population, right? Because you have gone back to where the whole pedigree includes every single individual living at that time. I, ho I hope that's clear. I hope that kind of kind of makes that that concept a little bit clearer. Okay, so let's get into when this was derived and kind of how the math works out. So this was this paper was um, by uh, Joseph Chang, um, who titled it uh, Recent Common Ancestor of All Present Day Individuals. I want to read just a little excerpt from the abstract. Um, this is the last line. He notes here that also continuing to trace back further into the past at about 1.77 log n generations before the present, where n is the population size, um, all partial ancestry of the current population ends in the following sense, with high probability for large n in each generation, at least 1.77 log n generations before the present, all individuals who have any descendants among the present day individuals are actually ancestors of all present day individuals. Now the math that he goes in to get this 1.77 is pretty involved, um, but we can make some pretty simple, um, we, can, we can show it logically pretty simply by just stating, as I've already shown, that when two to the K is equal to N, any individual that has descendants will exist in the pedigree as the ancestor of everyone. And so we can actually estimate how long ago we expect that to be in generations um, by just rearranging, right? So we're just going to rearrange this equation. Um, and to do that to so, we get K is equal to log with a base of two to N, right? And at that point, when K is equal to log base two of N, this K is the identical ancestor point, right? So at that generation back in time, all the individuals alive if they leave any descendants at all, are the ancestor of everyone alive. Um, and so I've plotted that here. So on the Y is the identical ancestor point, on the X is population size. One of the things that were argued about in the tweet and the Twitter war was, well, you don't know the population size. Well, it actually doesn't matter that much because there's a logarithmic relationship with K. And so as you can see here, even upwards to a hundred, this is a hundred million population size. And down here at the smallest end was a thousand. You can't even see it because the numbers get so small, but we're, we're increasing by orders of magnitude across this. You can see that the number of generations 
the interval there is really small, right? 40 generations to 45 generations is the difference between 10 million and 100 million. Um, so uh, even for a historical human population size of 100 million, the identical ancestor point is reached in around 45 generations. So if generation time is 30 years, that's about 1,350 years ago. Um, now, importantly, this is assuming a panmictic population. What that means is that individuals are randomly sampling the pedigree each generation back. Um, so that leads to another complaint in the Twitter war. But wait, what about geography? Obviously, humans have a very complex uh, migration history um, and you know, not a constant population size. So how might that impact uh, this particular estimate? Again, this math was done. So in 2004, uh, Chang, you can see, is a senior author on this paper as well, modeling the recent common ancestry of all living humans. Um, wrote it all, tested for the identical ancestor point using complex migration simulations based on our current understanding of human migrational patterns. Um, and this is what they write. Um, with 5% of individuals migrating out of their hometown, 0.05% migrating out of their home country, and 95% of, of port users born in the country from which the port emanates, the mean most recent common ancestor, now remember this is the genetic pedigree, uh, is 1415 BC, uh, and the mean identical ancestor date is 5353 BC. So that's about 250 or 245 generations ago. So again, in just you know a few thousand years, we have already reached the identical ancestor point for all humans alive, irrespective of where they are today. Okay, so in summary, genealogical pedigrees collapse on themselves as two to the K approaches the population size. And this sets a limit on the number of genealogical ancestors that exist today for anyone alive. Because of this, the identical ancestor point can be calculated, again, this is by Chang as K equals 1.77 log, log base two to the N. Under Penmixia, this is around 1,300 years ago for humans, and under realistic migration patterns, this is about 7,300 years ago. Again, this is a mean, and it will vary depending on you know, how you change those migration uh, numbers. Uh, the Chang paper stated that, that their simulations were pretty conservative, um, which means that this number uh, could potentially be even shorter than this. So, noting that Cheddar Man lived around 10,000 years ago, and the identical ancestor point that was estimated by Chang was 7,300 years ago. If Cheddar Man left any descendants, if, if anyone alive today has him in their pedigree, then he is the ancestor of every single one of us. And, and that's what we've shown here. So what's a lot more unlikely is that Cheddar Man did actually leave any pedigree descendants. But if he did, then he is within the pedigree of all of us. Um, so say hello to Grandpa many, 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 many generations back. Um, so with that, I hope you enjoyed uh, this video. Hope you learned something. If you have any questions, I know that this is kind of like a, a mind twist in how these, uh, and, and how all of this actually works out. Pedigrees can be kind of confusing, especially when you get back to this identical ancestor point. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. Um, and thank you for your time.